Thank you, Mark, and good morning. Hope all of you had an enjoyable Thanksgiving and a safe time together and are ready to get back into the book of Romans again this week, which we are in Romans chapter 12, a new section of the book where Paul begins to take all of that doctrine that he has expounded in the first 11 chapters and apply it. We looked at the first two verses last week. And now in verses 3 through 8, we read, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy, according to the portion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> The English preacher and poet John Donne famously wrote, No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent. Now that's true. We were not created to live independently of and uh, in isolation from one another, but together and connected. Mankind is joined by a common ancestor. We were made to live as brothers, but we are a continent at war, a fragmented race divided against itself, brother against brother. It's only in the church that the world is made whole through the redemption of Jesus Christ. In him, we are reunited. Paul says as much when he describes the church not as a continent, but as a body. It is alive. And like a physical body with many parts that uh, function in unity, we too as a church are diverse with many parts, many different kinds of people, and we must be united. Now that is Paul's great lesson here in our text in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. He began the chapter with the general exhortation to believe the, the things that God has written in all of the previous chapters, chapters 1 through 11, and has applied that to us at the beginning of chapter 12. began with this exhortation for believers to, in light of all of that, present their bodies as living and holy sacrifices to God. And in the remaining verses, he gives specific instruction on how we are to do that. Right behavior begins with right thinking. And Paul began the chapter by exhorting believers to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. Metamorpho is the, the Greek word. We get the word metamorphosis from that, being transformed. And you think of the butterfly that comes out of the caterpillar metamorphosis. That's kind of the idea that Paul is speaking of. We're to be completely changed by renewing our minds. And one of the basic characteristics of a renewed mind is humility. We cannot behave properly toward others if we lack humility, if we are prideful 
if we're arrogant. The world is at war because men are seeking their own advantage. And so Paul gives a strong exhortation here to be humble. He gives it on the basis of his authority as an apostle. And yet the way he speaks of that authority and the way he refers to himself as an apostle is done so in the most humble of ways. He says, through the grace given to me, I say. To the grace given to me, on that authority, I speak to you. And his apostleship was given to him, he says. It is a gift of God. It was not due to anything within him. He hadn't merited that position. In fact, as you think of Paul's conversion and when it was that God appointed him to be an apostle to the Gentiles, he was on his way to Damascus to kill Christians and to snuff out the very name of Jesus Christ. That's when God stopped him. That's when Christ appeared to him. That's when he was brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and gifted in this way. Oh, it was clearly a gift. It is not anything of merit within him. So he begins his instruction here in a very humble way. He, he exemplifies the very thing that he wants them to show. But still, his words have authority. They are not just the, the good advice of one Christian to another. They are the very words of an apostle. And what he says is, not just for any individual, it is for all Christians. It's not just for these particular believers in Rome, but for all of us. It is to everyone among you, he says, and we can expand that beyond those in Rome to every believer everywhere down through the ages. No one, he says, is to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. It is important to Paul that we understand that and that we act upon that. Humility is essential for good behavior. Humility is essential for morality. He wrote to the Roman church from Corinth and sent this off with Phoebe, this letter in her purse from Sincrea, which was the port of Corinth. But in Corinth, where he wrote this, he'd seen the consequences that arise from pride. That was one of the Corinthians' big problems. He'd seen how, how it divided the, the body there and frustrated the ministry. That is Paul's concern here in verses 3 through 8. The ministry of the church in the use of its spiritual gifts and that that go smoothly and that that go well. And to function well, we must have unity. And to have unity, we must have a correct understanding of ourselves, who we are, why we are who we are. And if we understand that, if we understand that we are everything by the grace of God, then that leads to humility. But even if Paul hadn't been in Corinth, and I do think that that experience really galvanized so much of his thinking here. If he had not been there and, and witnessed what he had, he would still have given this advice because Paul knew human nature. And it's the natural tendency of people to exalt oneself. James Denny was an important theologian in the early part of the 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, a Scottish New Testament scholar and theologian, and he made an insightful statement. He said, to himself, every man is, in a sense, the most important person in the world. Well, that's true. That, that's what man, apart from understanding the grace of God, being enlightened by the Holy Spirit, understands about himself. Well, I'm just the most important person in the world. What is done must be done for me. And that's true, as I say, but that's deadly. And so to overcome that, we need right thinking. We need to think, Paul says, so as to have sound judgment. And through sound judgment, a proper understanding of ourselves and what we're to do. And the way to have sound judgment is by measuring ourselves with an objective standard. God has given that, Paul says. He has allotted to each a measure of faith. He means saving faith, the faith by which we believe. 
Now that's how Paul consistently uses the word faith in the book of Romans. Uh, he doesn't mean when he says measure of faith, uh, the idea that God has given everyone a certain amount of faith, some a large amount of faith, and so they act in a very um, amazing way, very obedient. Uh, there's not so much faith, so their activity is rather small. I think there may be some truth to that, but that's not his point here, and that's not how he uses the word faith. Faith here is saving faith, and that, he says, is our standard. Well, isn't Christ our standard? Yes, of course Christ is our standard. We can look at Him and measure ourselves by Him, but here he's saying faith is our standard. And it's our standard, our measure, because when we consider the way we entered into union with Christ, how we entered into this new life, we realize that it was all of grace. Faith is the opposite of works. Righteousness. The righteousness that's imputed to us through faith. The righteousness that is a gift of God that sets us right with Him is a gift. We don't achieve it. We receive it. Salvation is not about merit. It's about mercy. God gives it freely. We simply receive it by faith. In fact, He gives faith freely. Justifying faith, saving faith. One of the theologians, William G.T. Shedd, made the point that, that justifying faith is the gift of God according to election. Well, when you understand it that way, you understand it is all of grace from eternity to eternity. Everything is the grace of God. And when we realize that, when we realize that everything about us is, is the work of God and a gift, we realize there's no room for boasting in ourselves. We can take absolutely no credit for who we are and what we have done as children of God or for our gifts as His servants. We have them, but our spiritual gifts are just that. They're gifts. Gifts of God. Paul spoke of, of this when he referred to his apostleship, the grace given to me. It's a gift. Yes, Paul would say, I have great authority, and it's authority given by God, but that's what he's underscoring there. It's given, it's a gift. He takes no pride in it, he acts upon it, but he doesn't boast in it. It's given to him. And that idea. That thought, that truth gives perspective. When Paul was dealing with the Corinthians and dealing with their pride, as I mentioned a moment ago, he made that very point in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. He wrote, Who regards you as superior? When I asked that question, he asked that question to them because the, the reality was, well, they regarded themselves as superior. They are quite proud of the gifts they had and the way they could use them. And who they were, they made quite a change in advance from the pagans that they had once been. And so, who regards you as superior? Well, if they are honest, they'd say, well, we all do. But the question he was asking was actually rhetorical. He says, then, what do you have that you have not received? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as, a, as if you had not received it? Well, of course, we receive everything. The very, the very life we have is a gift from God. The health we have is a gift from God. The abilities we have is a gift from God. And since everything's a gift, a person can take, can take no credit. And that should eliminate all boasting. Understanding faith and what it means prevents a person from thinking too highly of himself or herself. It also prevents a person from thinking too low of himself or herself, too low to be of any service to God. When we see God as the giver of all things, of our faith and of our spiritual life and our spiritual gifts, we, we recognize that we have gifts and therefore we have capabilities. God has not gifted us to fail. He's gifted us to succeed. 
And we should understand that and be encouraged by that. Every believer in Jesus Christ has been blessed with at least one spiritual gift, with, uh, with the spiritual ability to serve the saints. Knowing that, understanding that, should make us eager for service. So faith is the, the standard by which we measure ourselves. This is what we need to go back and uh, consider in order to, to get sound judgment, in order to, th to think clearly and behave rightly and have the kind of humility and perspective on life that we all need. Well, let me illustrate that just a little further. The, the meter is the basic unit in the metric system. In fact, the word Meter is derived from the Greek word that Paul uses here for measure or standard, metron. The meter is 39.37 inches long. In order to preserve the exactness of measurement, a platinum bar that length is in the Bureau of Weights and Measures outside of Paris. That bar is the standard. So if there's ever a dispute about how long the meter is, about its measurement, about the exact length of the meter, a person can go to Paris and to that place and can observe that standard. Well, it's the same way here. It's the same way to gain sound judgment, to gain right perspective. The, the true measure of ourselves, we need to go to the standard that God has allotted to us, and that is saving faith. And there we see that all that we have from beginning to end is a gift. Faith receives. And all we have, we have received as a gift of grace. So there's no basis for thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. That means we should be humble. And in verse 4, Paul gives the, the reason why humility is so necessary. The church must function in unity. And that is only possible if we are humble, if we are putting others first, if we are seeking to serve them. Well, to illustrate the, the, the importance of this, Paul draws an analogy between the, the human body, the physical body, and the church, between the physical and the spiritual. For, he says, meaning, let me explain or let me illustrate. He, here is the reason the standard has been given and, and the reason humility is necessary. Just as we have many members in one body and all members do not have the same function, the church also, he's going to say, has many members and many parts. The, the, the body is complicated. All of its, its parts have functions. Some are, are more obvious than others. In fact, most aren't quite so obvious. Most aren't seen. Most are hidden. But uh, all of these work together in harmony, in concert with one another for the health of the whole body. It's the same in the church. So we, who are many, Paul writes in verse 5, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Church is made up of all kinds of people. The church in Rome was divided between Jews and Gentiles. There were people of all social classes, slaves and freemen. So there was diversity in the early church. But Paul says... They were all members of one body. They all belonged to each other. A sort of piece of the same continent, or more to his point, of the same body. This is our relationship to one another as, one another as Christians. It's, it's different from the relationship that you have with your colleagues at work or your fellow students at the, at the university or at school even your natural family. Because we are in Christ. We are set apart and members of one another, joined to one another. 
and dependent on one another, like parts of the human body are dependent on each other. And God has equipped us so that we can be a blessing to one another. He has given spiritual gifts to each of us so that we can be of service to one another in the church. In verse 6, Paul states that, that, that they differ, and that they differ according to the grace given to us. So there are varieties of gifts, and God delights in variety. We see that in, the, in, in all of nature around us. Uh, God didn't make the world one color. He didn't create everything green or gray. He didn't make everything flat. He filled the world with a variety of colors, shapes, climates, plants, animals, and people. You can go on and on and list the, the different ways in which God has introduced variety richly in this world in which we live. And, and in the same way, he filled the church with variety, with all kinds of people whose lives and insights and experiences have much to offer each of us. And he gave the church a variety of gifts because there is, is much to do and many ways to do it. God hasn't uh, given us one thing to do. He's given us many things to do and they have a vast variety of ways that they must be done and so there are a vast variety of ways that these gifts can be applied and used. God doesn't want us to all have the same gift in other words. He doesn't want us all to have the same function. So we should understand that and understand that we are gifted, each one of us, with the gift that God wants us to have and shouldn't be envious of another gift, but be very pleased with, with what He's given to us and the function that we are to serve among His people. Our gifts have uh, been specifically given to us, uh, designed for us individually. They are, Paul says, according to the grace given to us. And that's true of everything. As I've indicated already, everything is really according to the grace given to us. Uh, intelligence, health, personality, opportunity, it's all according to the grace given to us. But, but Paul here is writing of something very specific, and what he's writing of here is spiritual gifts. What it is that makes the body function effectively, the church to function effectively. A spiritual gift is a, a special capacity for spiritual service to the church that is given to each of us by the Holy Spirit, given by grace. They are gifts of grace. Now to say gifts of grace is really to make a redundancy, but it also makes the point, and the point is they're not earned. They're not something that we achieve. The knowledge of that should help us to have the sound judgment that Paul has stated that we need to have. Sound judgment about ourselves, about who we are and what we are to be doing. We have abilities that when acted on, put to use, will lead to accomplishments and accomplishments of eternal value. But they're nothing to boast in. Nothing to boast about. They're gifts of grace. Paul makes that especially uh, clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11 where he states that the, the Holy Spirit distributes spiritual gifts to each individual, to each Christian, just as He wills. It has nothing to do with personal achievement or merit. Nothing and Christianity does. It's all of grace. So again, gifts give no cause for boasting. They are reason for humility and thankfulness. But because they are gifts, and they come from God, we are to take them very seriously, and we're to use them wisely, and we're to use them earnestly. If you've been given a gift of, by God, and you have if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it's been given to you to be used. And so we are to be conscientious about that. 
earnest about that. And in the remaining verses, Paul lists the gifts that have been given. Not all of the gifts, but he lists, lists seven of them here. And they fall into, <clears throat> into two categories that have been classified in various ways. But I think the simplest way to ca uh, classify the seven gifts that he lists here are gifts of speaking or gifts of service. The first that Paul lists is the gift of prophecy. Paul held this gift in high esteem. Prof prophecy was one of the foundational gifts of the early church. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, he states that the church has been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Apostles were the mouthpiece of God, the agents of His revelation. Now, prophecy is not preaching. I say that because some of the, the Puritans, like the, uh, the great Puritan theologian William Perkins, equated the two. They're trying to apply prophecy to his day, prophecy is preaching, and so that's how they treated it. But tr tr preaching is something different. Preaching is the exposition of Scripture. Prophecy is revelation. The revelation included predictions of the future. It's what we normally think of when we think of prophecy. But also it was information revealed for the edification and the help of the church. And this was essential in the early days of the church when the, the canon of Scripture, the inspired books, the New Testament, was still in the process of being formed. And so during that time, before they had the full revelation that God would give to the church, prophets were given to give direction to God's people. We have various examples of that. Agabus is one of the examples in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 11 we read that he came down from Jerusalem to Antioch and prophesied that a great famine all over the world was about to come. And he prophesied that to this young growing church in Antioch in order that they would be able to prepare for this, this great calamity that was about to come. So his prophecy helped them. Well, this is very different from the, the so-called prophets today who, who speak in vague generalities, very much like the ancient uh, Delphic oracle. She was the, the prophetess of Greece who would sniff vapors from the earth and then give vague predictions that could be interpreted in a variety of ways so that whatever happened, uh, they could be interpreted as being a fulfillment of what she had prophesied. And that's typical of the so-called prophets of today. But biblical prophecy has ended. The, the canon of Scripture is closed. God's revelation is complete. We don't need prophets. We have what the prophets have delivered in the Word of God. And we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Scriptures as our authority and the Spirit of God to enlighten our minds to understand the Scriptures. And the Scriptures are sufficient. What may not be sufficient is our application of our minds and our energy to interpreting them and understanding them. But the, the Scriptures are sufficient. We have the Spirit of God. We're simply to apply ourselves to it. But in Paul's day, they had prophets. And prophecies were to be examined. They were not to be taken at face value. And the reason for that was because they were false prophets as well. And they were to be tested. All who said that they had a prophecy were to be tested. As, uh, as they should be in our day when people make such claims. And so Paul writes that a, a person must prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. That is, in agreement with the faith. Now, that right in this here, faith is different from faith in verse 3. Same word, but the difference is this faith here has the definite article. It's the faith, meaning Christian truth, biblical doctrine. Those who prophesy were to do so according to this standard, according to orthodoxy. Uh, 
That's how one would know if the, pro the first standard is if that person was a genuine prophet is, well, what's his doctrine? How does it measure up with the revelation God has given? One of these modern prophets was, uh, that I've mentioned was a man named William Branham who was associated with the Jesus-only Pentecostals. He claimed to be a prophet. They claimed that he was a prophet, but he denied the Trinity. That's this small group of Pentecostals that, that called themselves Jesus-only. There's no Trinity. There's just one person in the Godhead. That's Jesus. And it's a modalistic view of the of God, that is in contradiction to the Word of God. That's not genuine truth. That's heresy, and that is an evidence that this is not a genuine was not a genuine person. This was the check that was given to the church, a check on heresy. It's orthodoxy. It's the Word of God. That's how we test the spirits. Prophets had to be orthodox in their beliefs. And, and that's the correct standard for today. We can apply that to the, those who teach, who proclaim the gospel. Is their gospel according to the scriptures? Is it according to the standard? We must measure all things in that way. In verse 7, Paul moves on to service. Now, this is a, a general term and became the, the normal way of describing the work that Christians do for others. Serving is, the, the word here is the word used uh, from which we get the word deacon. Uh, diakonia is the Greek word. And it's really two words together, dia and konia. Dia is through and konia is dust. And so it gives you this picture of through dust. That is uh, suggestive of the kind of activity that's associated with service. It is somewhat menial in one sense, so that can be understood in the dust, but also very earnest, stirring up the dust. Well, it would include almost any kind of work in the ministry other than ministry of utterance or speaking. So it, it is often a behind-the-scenes type of ministry that doesn't involve a lot of public recognition. The ability to do that kind of service is a gift of God. The desire to do that is a gift from God. It should not be shunned as insignificant. It is a great blessing to God's people to have individuals who do the behind the scenes type of work. No church can function without those people doing service. In addition to our, to our deacons, I don't think this applies simply to that. In fact, I don't think we're to restrict it at all to the deacons. He's not really speaking of deacons here. He's talking about people who are gifted in the church to serve in a variety of ways. But we, we have that uh, in our own assembly. If you just simply think about it, people who, um, who, who work in the media ministry, people who work in the mercy ministry, people who fix meals and deliver meals, people who work... And the nursery, it's a good ministry for, for individuals to have. It's not a, an unimportant ministry to work in the nursery, and to help in that way. We all need to be servants. But some individuals, Paul is saying, are especially gifted for serving in this way. Well, third gift, the third gift listed is teaching. He who teaches, Paul says, is to be active in his teaching. Teachers differed from prophets. Prophets were inspired by God. Teachers are illuminated by God. They are enlightened. Prophecy is revelation. Teaching is explanation. The role of the teacher was particularly vital in the early church because Many Christians had very little or no education. There were a lot of slaves within the early church. Many from very humble backgrounds were in the church, not educated people. And even of those who were, there were very few books in which to train themselves. So the ordinary church member learned the Bible and learned doctrine from the teacher. So it was essential 
that a teacher work diligently at teaching. That's what Paul is encouraging here. Be diligent in that. It's the same today. If the teaching ministry of a church is weak, that church will be weak. It will be immature and susceptible to error and then apostasy. It's susceptible to people who come along and say they're prophets and, and speak of uh, Jesus only understanding of the Godhead, that kind of thing. You, you see this in 1 John. Uh, he says, in, John, in writing that letter, speaks of those who went out from us because they were not really of us. It, it had caused a crisis within that church. Who were these individuals that went out from them? Evidently some influential people who had a different idea of truth and gospel. And so... Paul sets forth, or rather John sets forth, standards to judge things. Who's genuine? And one of them, one of the three tests of life in that book is doctrine, orthodoxy. So we, we need the solid teaching of the Word of God. Every church does, if it's going to be strong. The importance of this gift for the church is witnessed in the fact that um, some of the last words that the Apostle Paul wrote were those to his young disciple and son and child in the faith, Timothy. And in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, he wrote, preach the word. It's as though he's saying, Timothy, if I, have, if I only say one thing to you before I depart this world, because he goes on to speak about his departure, it is preach the word. So teachers must be busy doing that and preparing to do that so that they will be able to do it, teach accurately. That means they must spend most of their time in their studies laboring over the, the Bible and books, which is one reason it's so necessary to have people with the gift of service, people who, who get out and help and, and allow teachers to prepare. So, so you see, the gifts complement each other. They work together. The gift of exhortation is the next on Paul's list in verse 8. He who exhorts is to be at work exhorting, encouraging, comforting, and counseling. All of that, I think, is meant in that, that, that gift and that statement. It, it can be done from the pulpit by exhorting people to... to uh, to live out the truth of the gospel and to expound the scriptures in, the, in this way. Or it can be done through private counseling and giving direction to individuals who are confused about things or just in conversation, one friend giving comfort or encouragement to another. We all need that. One of the great examples of this in the New Testament is Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement. After Paul's conversion, he came to Jerusalem, but, but found very few people willing to meet him. In fact, no one wanted to meet with Paul. They were all afraid of him. He was Saul of Tarsus. He was the persecutor of the church. But in Acts chapter 9, and verse 27, we read, Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles. He came alongside of Paul. He encouraged him and helped him further in his ministry. That is such an important ministry in the church to help heal the wounded and bind up the brokenhearted, to strengthen people, to give direction and encourage them along the way of faith. That's the Lord's ministry. And He does it in a special way through people that he has so gifted. Well, the fifth gift is the gift of giving, of uh, sharing a person's resources with those less fortunate. We all are responsible to do that. We're all responsible to give out of what God has blessed us with. The, the Lord prays the, prays the widow for her might. But those with this gift sometimes, not always, but sometimes are those who are blessed with large resources. Wealth is a gift. It is a blessing. And in, in, 
In the end, God will require all those who have been blessed with whatever they have, however much it is, they'll, they'll be required to give an accounting of how they used the resources that he gave to them. The way Paul says giving is to be done is with liberality. That can also mean simplicity in the sense of single-mindedness, of motive and of purpose. And the idea is giving must be done without an ulterior motive, without a hidden motive of uh, gaining influence or praise or anything like that. It should be done for no other reason than to relieve a need, to help an individual. Well, next Paul says, he who leads is to lead with diligence. Paul uses this word elsewhere of leaders of the church. So generally it applies to elders. They are to be uh, diligent in their tasks. They're not to become slack in the work of the church or discouraged. That can happen can happen to anyone in a position of leadership, whether it's an elder or simply a teacher or one who's uh, uh, in a more private way, leading individuals in a, in a Bible study. The author of Hebrews exhorts the congregation to support the elders, to, to help the leaders of the church, not to discourage them, but to help. Well, finally, Paul writes, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Uh, this, is a, this is very broad in its application from helping the poor financially to visiting the sick or caring for the elderly. In this fallen world, there will never cease to be a need for mercy, for people who take care of the helpless. And the way to do it is, as Paul says, with cheerfulness not with, with grim determination, but with joy, and to bring that joy to, to others. A person is, is a, a blessing who walks on to a hospital ward with cheerfulness. Not just a smile, but a cheerful word, a word of grace, a word of hope and encouragement from God's word. There is uh, so much more to Christian ministry than, than doing this, than preaching or teaching. It's, that's, that's at the center of it, but that's not all. There's so much more. The church needs servants. In um, his latter years, Cornelius Van Til, who was a, a professor of New Testament at Princeton Seminary and then went to Westminster Theological Seminary where he ministered for many, many years in the classroom and in preaching, got to the point in his latter years when he could do none of that. He couldn't teach, he couldn't preach. And so what he did is he went to hospitals. He continued doing that, visiting the sick. A very humble, but very important thing. We can always be doing works of service. All of the gifts that Paul lists here, these seven gifts, are gifts of service. Their purpose is to help one another is to build up the church. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, Paul explains that. He says they are for the common good. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 12, they are for the edification of the church. Every Christian, again, has at least one gift, one spiritual gift. Maybe more, but certainly one. They're not for personal edification. They're not given to you to bless you, but for you to be a blessing to others, to build them up and produce unity in the church so that we might function well. No man is an island. Every man is a piece of the continent. But man naturally lives as an island like Ishmael, whose hand was against everyone and who dwelt apart from his brothers. That's the tendency of individuals, apart from the grace of God. Now, only grace can change that. Only Christ can change that. He has made us a spiritual nation, but one that can only function effectively, can only function at all in unity. We need each other. 
We are individually members one of another, Paul says. If life is at all unsatisfying, I'm talking about your Christian life, if it seems somewhat unrewarding, well, maybe it's because you're neglecting the fellowship of the saints, not spending time with other Christians, not worshiping with them and ministering to them, not benefiting from them and their ministry of, of, of the exercise of their gift, but not using your own gift. Well, you, you, you have a gift, as I've said, and you find that gift by getting involved, by serving others. Uh, what a sad thing it would be to come to the end of your life and say, I lived for self and not for others. I was an island. But God help us not to be like that and not to drift off into our own selfish little world, but to extend ourselves and expand ourselves and reach out. But before a person can do that, before a person can serve Christians and be a vital part of the church, one must become a part of the church he or she must become a part of Jesus Christ in him. And that only happens by the grace of God. Understanding that in and of ourselves we're lost, we're under the guilt of sin, and we need a Savior to deliver us from all of that. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. And we enter into his salvation through faith alone. Christ died for sinners. He died in their place so that all who believe in Him will be saved. If you've not done that, if you haven't trusted in Him, do so. Believe in Him. Trust in Him. He receives all who do and then serve Him and serve one another. May God help all of us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your goodness to us. And we're reminded here of, of one aspect of Your goodness and grace, and that is You have equipped all of us who are believers in your Son, to serve, to be of great use. And so, Lord, we pray that you would kindle within each of us a desire to use our gifts, to be active in service, unified with one another, and a help to each other. We can do that because we have gifts that are from you. And as we apply them, they will be effective and beneficial. We thank you for your grace. We thank you most of all for the grace we have in Christ that has saved us and given us a glorious inheritance. We thank you for him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.